And is there, are there any other kind of generic general questions you want to ask before I kind of launch into my slides? Okay. We're very close to start starting time here. The sessions will be recorded, and um, I will record them on my computer as a full as a full. So you'll see pretty much what you see on the Zoom in the Zoom slide recorded, and I will create a file and uh, download it to YouTube. It might take a little while because the the files tend to be huge, and I have to kind of manage them so that they get through to YouTube. But uh, it should get on sooner rather than later, probably by the end of today. Okay, it's 10.30, so we're going to get started. Um, if you have your slides with you, great. If not, you can follow along with the slides that you should be able to see on your screen. But when we last talked, and it was a while back, we talked about uh, estimating the return on capital for the, for the Rio Disney theme park. I mean, return on capital is an accounting number. It's accounting earnings, after-tax operating income, divided by accounting measures of what's invested in the project, invested capital. So let me very quickly review how we got this number because it's been a while. We estimated the revenues for the theme park. And basically, the key word is estimate. Nobody knows what a Rio Disney theme park will deliver. So if you're the analyst, you've got to project out the revenues based on what you see in other theme parks. We estimated the expenses and we subtracted those expenses out and we then had two expenses that were allocated. One was depreciation amortization, the other was allocated GNA, essentially expenses that are really not cash expenses for this theme park but are allocated to this theme park to come up with operating income. The key thing to remember is we did not subtract out any interest expenses we might have with the debt used in the theme park. It's not because we don't use debt but because we're computing a return on overall invested capital in the theme park, which means your income should be before interest expenses. So we came up with operating income. Incidentally, I don't know whether I talked about this, but if you go back a few slides and you look at the operating income and how we computed it, one of the things I might not have mentioned is in the first two years of the operating income, this is back on page 218, I have losses. I have an operating loss in year one, an operating loss in year two, and an operating loss in year three. Now, normally, if you're a standalone business with operating losses, what happens is you carry those losses forward into future years when you have income and you claim those losses against the income. That's not what I'm doing with this theme park. In this theme park, what I'm doing is taking the losses on the theme park and offsetting it against income from the rest of the company to save on taxes right away. Why? Because it's better to save on taxes right now than wait four years to do it. So I get the after-tax operating income after tax. So basically, that's my bottom line for earnings. I divide that after-tax operating income by the book value of capital. What goes into book value of capital? Anything that I treat as a capital expense. So it's capital expense. Minus, uh, if I depreciate things, I, the, the book value will decrease. Every time I make capital expense to go up, I'm also adding what I've invested in working capital to it to come up with total book value of capital. If you divide after-tax operating income by book value of capital, you come up with this accounting measure of return called return on capital. It's a return on what you're making on the overall project. And what you do is you compare that return to a cost of capital. And towards the end of the last session, I talked about what cost of capital to use. And I said, we should be using the cost of capital at Disney theme parks. Why? This is a theme park investment. I shouldn't be comparing to the cost of capital for the whole company or the cost of equity. If I computed net income, which would be after interest expenses, and just looked at the book equity in this project and got a return on equity, then I could have used cost of equity. But here, because I'm looking at return on capital, I use the cost of capital theme parks. One additional factor to keep in mind is because this the, the theme park is set in Rio, I have to I have to add an additional country risk premium. That country risk premium reflects the fact that Rio is a risky part of the world and I'm building a theme park there. And the easiest way, to, so I'm, the reason I'm going through these slides so fast is this from last session. The easiest way to bring in the country risk, is it okay now? Okay, I think our uh, the, the broadband went in and out. Is, okay, good. Okay. The easiest way to bring in country risk is to incorporate the country risk premium into my equity risk premium. And if you do that, you end up with a cost of capital of about 8.5% for this theme park. 
So that becomes what I need to make on this theme park. What I can actually make is only 4.18%, which is the average. And I left you with this slide, which is, would you be willing to reject this theme park based on this analysis? And I kind of gave away the answer. I said, there are a couple of reasons why you should be reluctant to reject the theme park. It's a big investment and it's a big decision. Can you imagine you Walt know, Disney in 1958 looking at Disneyland saying, hey, the return on capital over the next 10 years is not good enough to cover my cost of capital, so I'm not gonna open the theme park. And let me elucidate the reasons why I think it's difficult to reject this theme park. The first is, you know, look at the measure of return I have. It's an accounting return, right? Accounting returns basically reflect accounting earnings, accounting invested capital. And if you remember last session, okay, if you remember last session, we talked about what a good measure of return would look like. We said it should be based on incremental cash flows, should be time weighted, and should have all side effects built in. And this return doesn't meet any of those criteria. The second is I did stop my numbers after 10 years. You say, why after 10? Completely arbitrary. Maybe I just got tired. And the reason I think that's so unfair is if you look at a typical theme park investment for Disney, it's a 50, 60, 70 year investment. Cutting off the investment after 10 years, you're cutting the investment off right at the peak of its cash flows. So I would say don't make a decision yet. I've given you the accounting numbers. They don't look, you know, they don't look good, good right now. But let's see if we can go from earnings to cash flows and then cash flows to incremental cash flows and incremental cash flows to time weighted incremental cash flows. No. If, 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 if you're having trouble with the audio, I'm going to be, it's being recorded and I will make sure the recording should be okay because it's on my computer. It's not online i i'm sorry it's you know it's uh, it's basically i think my my son is streaming his class he's not young enough to be playing video games but he's streaming his class and he's um, you know he's doing the rest of his semester and my wife is streaming her class to the second grade class that she's teaching we're all streaming so let me repeat what 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 i was just saying I, the return on capital computed over using accounting earnings and invested capital is low, much lower than the cost of capital. But I don't want to reject this theme park for a couple of reasons. One is an accounting return is not cash flows, it's not incremental, it's not time weighted. So it's not a good measure of return. The other is I stopped arbitrarily after 10 years. If you'd extended this project out to 15, 20, 25 years, the returns would have gone up. I just arbitrarily stopped after 10 years. You're saying you got to stop somewhere, you know? And the, 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 the problem with stopping somewhere is, that in this particular case, I'm stopping too soon for a theme park which can go on 30, 40, or 50 years, you know? So let's take this return on capital and see if we can use this to measure how well the project is doing, uh, how well a, an entire company can do. This is actually one of the measures in corporate finance and consulting that's taken off in the last decade. And it's, it's, it's a measure that's used to assess whether an entire firm is doing well or not. So you go back to the very first class. I talked about how you can take a business and break it down into assets in place and growth assets. I don't know whether you remember, but I said that's the way you can think about a company. One of the questions you might want to ask about your company, remember the company you're doing on your project? is whether your existing investments, assets in pla place, are good investments. And one very simplistic, and I use the word simplistic intentionally, proxy for how good your existing assets in place are, is to compute the return on capital for your existing company. So here's what I'm doing. Let's take Disney. Disney in the most recent year had after-tax operating income of $6.92 billion. Its invested capital was about 54.9 billion. So I'm just taking the book value of debt and the book value of equity. This is the only place in finance where we use book values because everywhere else, if you remember, we've used market values when we did cost to capital, debt equity ratios. If I divide the after-tax operating income by the invested capital, I get a return on capital for Disney as a company of 12.61%. You're saying, what does that even mean? To the degree that I trust my accountants, and I assume that the invested capital in the company is what's invested in existing projects, Disney is making a 12.61% return on capital on its projects. Remember the cost of capital we computed for Disney as a company was 7.81%. 
You take the difference between those two numbers, it looks like Disney is making 4.8% more than its cost of capital. At least on average, it is earning more than its cost of capital. I do this for all five of my companies. In fact, for four of my companies, I was earning more than my cost of capital. Now, when you do this for your, pro for your company, and I'd strongly recommend you do this while the iron is hot, while you still remember this concept, what you're trying to gauge is whether your existing projects are good or bad. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not telling you much about the future, but it's telling you something about existing projects. And it's always worth stopping and asking why. Why are my returns greater than my cost of capital? You say, isn't this true for most companies? Later on in the class, we'll talk about you know, how the return on capital and cost of capital compare across companies, but this is not easy to do, to earn more than your cost of capital. And if you think about why you might be able to do it, it's because you bring some comparative advantages to this process. With Disney, what are those comparative advantages? That's relatively easy to see. It comes from, you know, the Mickey Mouse brand. I mean, it is brand name. It's a fact that they've spent 70 years kind of nurturing a group of consumers through their younger years. So you can see where Disney's competitive advantages come from. But that's basically why we do this, is to get a sense of are my projects good or bad. Now, just as a detour, though, I have to tell you that return on invested capital, while it's being used by lots of people, consultants and bankers particularly, is a particularly dangerous number because everything in the return on capital comes from an accounting calculation. In the numerator, you have operating income, an accounting measure of earnings. In the denominator, you have book value of capital invested, another accounting number. You're saying, so what? Everything accountants do to change those numbers will affect your return on invested capital, and sometimes in bad ways. It can affect whether you make a judgment on the company or what kind of judgment you make. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you have a company that has taken bad projects in the past. It's taken terrible investments. Accountants wake up and realize they've taken a terrible investment. So you know what they do? They write off the investment. What happens when you write off an investment? You reduce your capital investment. So if you're not even aware that they've done this and it's two years late and you compute the return on capital for this company, you might get a sense that this company is taking good projects when in fact it's taken its worst projects off the books. Similarly, there's a lot of inflation. You have to worry about how book value, because the book value in much of the world reflects what you originally paid. If you have a lot of inflation, your projects might look good, not because they're good projects, but because inflation has happened to your earnings, but your book value stayed frozen. Anytime accountants misclassify leases and R&D, they're affecting your invested capital. Similarly, in your operating income, any one-time income or expenses can affect your operating income. What I'm trying to say is, when you compute your return on capital for last year for your company, don't get too carried away. It's an accounting number and it can be aff affected by accounting choices. I told you a little later, I'll, you, I'll show you it's not that much later. This actually shows you how difficult it is for companies to earn more than the cost of capital. At the start of 2020, I computed the return on capital, so that's a blue column, and the cost of, I'm sorry, return on capital minus the cost of capital. So forget about the blue and the red. The return on capital versus the cost of capital for every company that's publicly traded, 40,000 plus companies. Then I classified companies on whether the return on capital was higher than the cost of capital or lower than the cost of capital. Let's take the global numbers. Globally, 52% of companies earned a return on invested capital less than the cost of capital. Think about it. Now, what did we just say? If you earn more than the cost of capital, you're creating value. It's a, it's a good project. Less than the cost of capital, you're destroying value. It's a bad project. 52% of companies collectively had a problem. They were not earning their cost of capital. 33% of companies earn more than the cost of capital, and about 30% of those companies actually earn, you know, at least in the US, earn at least 2% more than the cost of capital. So if you look at the very right side of the chart, those are your really good companies. If you look at the left side of the chart, these are the companies in trouble. Again, I don't want to get too carried away because these are based on last year's return on invested capital. The God only knows what the crisis is going to do to these numbers next year, but last year's return on capital, some companies can say it was a bad year where you're young and growing companies, but it tells you that earning more than your cost of capital is not that easy to do. So let's, 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 let's summarize. Take your company and look at what it made as operating income last year. That's what earnings before interest and taxes is. 
Now, net out the taxes you'd have paid, use an effective tax rate if need be in this computation. Divided by the book value of debt plus book value of equity minus cash, preferably from the previous year. Why from the previous year? Because it's very difficult to make returns on investments you made at the end of the year. Computed return on capital. If you've already kept up with the project, you should already have a cost of capital. Let's keep up with the delusion that you've kept up with the project and had a cost of capital. Com compare the return on capital to the cost of capital. That measure at least as a rough measure tells you whether your company is in the good column or the bad column right now. Doesn't mean things can't change in the future, but at least you have a snapshot of the present. In fact, about 25 years ago, there was this measure promoted by a consulting firm called Stern Stewart called EVA or Economic Value Added. It was a hugely oversold measure. At one point, half of all the S&P 500 companies were paying Stern Stewart to compute the EVA for them which is kind of silly because if you look at what the EVA is, it's a return spread that we just computed, the difference between return on capital and cost of capital multiplied by the invested capital. Anybody can do this. Why pay a consultant 50000 or $500,000 to do it? It's a dollar measure of excess returns, but it's kind of a snapshot of where your company is. So it's just a tangent because it has nothing to do with the theme park, but we've taken a measure that came out of, out of the investment analysis, return on capital, and applied it to an entire company. I don't want to kind of you know, push through, so let me pause and open up for questions. You might want to put it into the chat because I can't see hands or too many. There might be too many. So if you have any questions about return on capital, cost of capital, and that comparison, I'll give you a couple of minutes to kind of put those questions in the chat. One of the questions that Shashanka Pradhan asked was whether share buybacks would destroy the ratio. Absolutely. And here's why. When you buy back shares, the market value of equity is much higher than the book value of equity. You write off disproportionate amounts of invested capital. Let's take an example. Let's suppose you have a company where shares are trading at three times book value. And this company goes out and buys 10% of its shares. It could wipe out its entire book equity. In fact, there are companies with negative book equity in the U.S. because they did share buybacks. And if you compute the return invested capital for these companies, you're going to get too high a number. So share buybacks definitely do it. Now, is there a way to adjust for accounting write-offs? Yes, but it's a lot of work. I actually did this for a company. And here's what you need to do. You need to go back over time because you can't just look at last year. You've got to look at the last 10 years. Take all the write-offs over the last 10 years. Capital IQ keeps track of it and add it back to your invested capital. You say, what a pain in the neck. Hey, you ask me whether you can do it. It can be done, but it's a lot of work. Okay. Let's, so let's move on. Let's go back to the project now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that, the Rio Disney and I'm going to go first from earnings to cash flows and then from cash flows to incremental cash flows, and then from incremental cash flows to time-weighted cash flows. You ready? Let's start with going from after-tax operating income to cash flows. To get from after-tax earnings to cash flows, there are three adjustments and only three you ever need to make. If you remember these, you're gonna be fine going from earnings to cash flows in any context. First, I'm gonna add back all non-cash expenses. Do you see why? Because to get from earnings to cash flows, if I've subtracted out things like depreciation and amortization, which are accounting expenses, I'm not reduced my cash flows, so I'm gonna add back depreciation and amortization. So you see the first line item? I'm gonna add back those, the, the depreciation and, non, and, and amortization. Add back all non-cash expenses. Second, I'm gonna subtract out capital expenditures, saying why are you doing that? Remember that even though accountants don't treat CapEx as an accounting expense, it is a cash outflow. You can't go to somebody you buy a machine, buy equipment from and say, look, this is capital investment. I'm not going to pay you right now. You still have to pay them. So you subtract out capital expenditures. So you add back depreciation and amortization. You subtract out capital expenditures. And then you subtract out change in non-cash working capital. You say, why are you doing that? If you remember last session, I talked about accrual earnings. Accrual earnings, you record transactions as they happen. And I said, working capital is the residue of accrual earnings. So what I'm doing when I'm adding back change in working capital is essentially converting accrual earnings into cash earnings. So add back depreciation and amortization, subtract out CapEx, subtract out change in working capital. So let's take year one. 
Year one, I had after-tax operating income of minus 32 million, right? Didn't look too bad. But once I, you know, add, you know, add back depreciation and subtract, ca subtract our capex, which is huge, still in year one, because I'm still building the Epcot theme park, I get a negative cash flow of minus, minus 982 million. So you compare the, the cash flow column to the after-tax operating income column, you can already see how different it is, especially early, when I'm spending a lot of money to look at cash flows instead of earnings. So to get from earnings to cash flows, add back depreciation and amortization, subtract out capex, subtract out change in working capital. We pause right there to make sure there are no questions about the mechanics of going from earnings to cash flows. Now, when I do that, it looks like I'm kind of cleaning up for depreciation because he's saying if you subtract out depreciation to get to operating income and then you add back the depreciation, why even bother? Why not just ignore depreciation altogether? The reason you cannot ignore depreciation altogether is because it leaves a tax effect. And here's why. When I reduce my operating income by the depreciation, I also reduce my taxable income. And when I reduce my taxable income, I reduce my taxes. The reason depreciation matters in companies is because it provides a tax benefit and we actually know what that tax benefit is. It's hidden in your cash flows. If you know what your tax rate is, in this case for Disney, it's 36.1%. And I take 36.1% of my depreciation every year. That kind of isolates my tax benefit. So if you ask me how much of my cash flow is coming from depreciation tax benefits, in year one I'm getting 36% of 50 million, which is the depreciation. And if you go through time, that is my depreciation tax benefits. That's why depreciation and amortization matter. One reason you've got to be a little cautious with amortization is not all amortization is tax deductible. For instance, if you have goodwill and you amortize goodwill, it used to be the old way we did goodwill, that amortization was not tax deductible. That you can completely ignore because that has no tax effects. So the reason we care about depreciation is because it leaves a tax effect. Interesting side twist here. If you're working for a non-profit doing project analysis and non-profits pay no taxes, you can completely ignore depreciation because if your tax rate is zero, you can see that depreciation can be completely ignored, which means you can do the operating income without even netting out depreciation and you don't have to add it back. But in any other context, you have to add back. That the, add back the depreciation because that'll give you the tax benefits in the cash flows. Right? Now, one of the things that we used to have a choice on in the US, which we don't have a choice on anymore, is when you got to depreciate an asset, you got to pick what kind of depreciation method you could use. Right? So if you remember your accounting class, the simplest depreciation method is called straight line depreciation. In straight line depreciation, if you have a 10 year life, you take your asset and you spread it out over 10 years. If you spend a billion dollars and you have a 10 year life, you take 100 million in depreciation every year. There are alternative depreciation methods which are called accelerated depreciation methods. You still get to depreciate the billion dollars, but you get more depreciation up front and less later. So the total depreciation of your project life remains the same with both methods. So I have a question and I'd like you to think about the answer to this question. Let's say you're doing a project analysis and you get to pick which depreciation method to use. First question is about earnings early on, year one, year two. Which depreciation method, straight line or accelerated, is going to give you higher earnings up front? I get a lot of straight lines and that's absolutely right. Why? Because with straight line depreciation, you get a lower depreciation expense and higher income. So if your objective is to maximize earnings early on, you're going to go with straight line depreciation. But remember, the tax benefit of depreciation is whatever you claim is depreciation times the tax rate, right? And the only effect of depreciation, I said, was the tax effect. Which approach will give you the higher cash flows in year one and year two? Yeah, accelerated depreciation. Do you see why? Because with accelerated depreciation, you'll have lower earnings, but the tax benefits will be higher. So if you use straight line depreciation, you report higher earnings, but if you use accelerated depreciation, you have higher cash flows. Wouldn't it be nice if you could keep your, if you could eat your cake and have it too? And there are many US companies that actually are able to pull off this trick. And here's why. 
U.S. companies are allowed to have two sets of books, tax books and reporting books. So guess what they do? In the reporting books, which is what you and I see, 10Ks, annual reports, they use straight line depreciation. And in the tax books, they claim accelerated depreciation. You think that's not right. Hey, as long as you're allowed to maintain two sets of books, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to report higher earnings to you and I, because that's what investors seem to care about, earnings. But then they claim higher cash flows by using accelerated depreciation in their tax books. So depreciation affects your cash flows through the tax benefit. And the higher your tax rate, the greater the tax effect of depreciation. So I'm going to pause. Any questions on depreciation and amortization? Okay. Let's move on to capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are not treated as accounting expenses. They're spread out over time as depreciation. Okay? And generally, when you look at capital expenditures, there are two types of capital expenditures in a project. The first is the upfront initial capital expenditure. In the case of the Disney theme park, this is actually building the theme park, the infrastructure, the rides. That's called initial or, or growth capex. But there's a second category of capital expenditures called maintenance capex. What's maintenance capex? Let's take the Disney theme park again. If you've ever been to a Disney theme park, you'll notice there are some rides that are shut down. Why? Because Disney's either putting in a new ride or revamping an existing ride. Why do they need to do that? Because the rides start to look old and decrepit after a while. Maintenance capex is not just maintenance expense, it's big maintenance expense to kind of bring the theme park up to perhaps not as good as new, but to something that, that people want to come back to. You're saying, do I need to do maintenance capex? You don't need to. You could just ignore maintenance capex, but in theme park, it's going to look like crap as you get older and older. So one of the questions of how much maintenance capex you need depends on what kind of objective you have when in your project. Let me explain. If you open a theme park and you say, look, I'm going to run this theme park for only 15 years. I'm going to run it in the ground and then shut it down you're not going to put much maintenance capex. The more you want your, your investment to continue for the long term, the more maintenance capex you will need to keep that investment going. So I'll make my, I'll make my decision for Rio Disney. Disney's history with theme parks is they want these theme parks to continue for very long periods. And I'm going to assume that they will do the same thing with Rio Disney. So every year, they will be putting in maintenance capex. And that's why when you looked at the capex, to kind of keep the theme park going for a really long time period. So initial capex, you don't have much choice on. You have to build a theme park. Maintenance capex is going to depend on whether you want to run this theme park for 15 years or 50 years. And the longer you want the theme park to go, the more maintenance capex you need. You're saying, well, what am I going to try tie maintenance capex to? Well, remember, if you believe that depreciation is what you're losing in kind of in your capital assets every year, Putting back a chunk of that depreciation back into the theme park is one way to make sure that your maintenance capex. Is my audio back again? Okay, good, sorry. Yes. Hey. Professor, do you want to try shutting your video? The audio will be perfect then. Well, the only problem is then the recording will have no slides either. So I can try to do a lower stream. Oh. No, I, uh, it's um, if it if it keeps dropping out, maybe that's what we'll do is go back just to, uh, to the audio. Now, uh, I'll repeat what I just said is, uh, you know, I was talking about CapEx and the difference between upfront CapEx or growth CapEx and maintenance CapEx. The case of Rio Disney, the growth CapEx is what I need to build the theme park. The maintenance CapEx is what I put back into the theme park in big investments to keep the theme park going for a very long life. And that doesn't have to be the case. Some, theme, some projects you might say, look, the project is a 10 year project. I'm going to run it into the ground and shut it down. But if you want your project to continue for the long term, you need to essentially have more investments back into long term assets. And that's what maintenance capex does, is it allows you to keep a project going for a really long period. So again, using the same framework we use for depreciation, let's talk about capex. So let's say you run your own software business and that you've spent a hundred million dollars. This is a really old example. 
who makes CDs anymore, but let's go along with it. That you've spent $100 million for uh, producing and selling promotional CDs or digital downloads in uh, online. Your accountant tells you that you can either expenses 100 million or depreciate it over three years. Okay, so you have two choices. You can either expenses 100 million or depreciate it over the year. Which one will have the more positive effect on earnings? So let's start with earnings. Expensing versus depreciation. Which one will have the better effect on earnings? To expense it or to capitalize and depreciate it? Okay, I'm getting a lot of capitalized and depreciate, and you can see why, right? Because when you capitalize, depreciation is going to be a much smaller number than expensing. But then when you look at the effect on cash flows, which would you rather do? You want to expense it. And here again, you're, you see many companies trying to dance on both sides, especially many of these young user-driven, customer-driven companies. Because you know what the equivalent of this, this, this choice is? is the cost of acquiring customers. Groupon, for instance, when it went uh, public three years ago, made oh, many more years, five years ago, made the argument that the cost of acquiring its users was essentially an acquisition cost. It was actually a capital expense. So they argued it shouldn't be expense. So they reported earnings before the acquisition cost. But then when they did their taxes, they claimed the acquisition cost as an expense. So be aware that companies are going to try to dance both these dances at the same time, but it's a, it's a factor to keep in mind when you think about should I capitalize something or should I expense it. Finally, let's talk about the working capital effect. And then the best way I have of illustrating why working capital effect affects your cash flows is to think about opening a store, right? Let's suppose you decide to open a store. Now, before you open the doors to the store, invite customers in, you know what you need to do, right? You need to fill the shelves with the inventory. So let's say you fill the shelves with the inventory. It costs you $100,000. So you've tied up $100,000 in inventory. You open the store and people start to come in and they start buying stuff off the shelves. You say, good, I'll make my money back. At the end of the day, you've sold a third of your inventory. Guess what you have to do before the start of the second day? You got to refill the inventory. Otherwise, your store is going to be empty in three days. Every day you keep restocking the inventory, you've got $100,000 tied up in inventory through the life of the store. In fact, if your business is growing, you're gonna to have to have more and more inventory in the store. So if your inventory goes from 100,000 to 120,000 after year one, you gotta bring in an extra 20,000. Essentially, inventory and accounts receivable tie up cash because that inventory, while it's sitting on your shelves, costs you cash, but you don't get the cash back. So here's the way to think about, about working capital. The initial investment you make in inventory and accounts receivable is a cash outflow right away. If that's all you need, you never have to invest any more in inventory or accounts receivable, that's it, you're done. Every time inventory and accounts receivable go up though, that's an additional investment to make. So it's a change in working capital that affects your cash flows. So let me emphasize again. Total working capital is cash tied up, but it's only the change in that working capital that affects your cash flows. Anytime working capital increases, it decreases your cash flow. And anytime working capital decreases, it increases your cash flow. So when you look at working capital, the reason you care for cash flow purposes, it's just tied up cash. So any questions on working capital? So think in terms of a store, think in terms of inventory. It's probably the most intuitive way of thinking about how does it affect my cash flows. No questions on working capital? So now I'm ready to go from cash flows to incremental cash flows. You're saying, what the heck are incremental cash flows? I'll give you a test, a very simple test you can run to decide what's incremental and what's not. Ask two questions. What will happen if I take this project? and then ask, what will happen if I don't take this project? If the answer is the same to both questions, that particular item is non-incremental. You say, what are you talking about? Let me give you an example. At the very start of this project description, and this is a while back, you might not remember, um, a lot, uh, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, when we talked about this, I said that Disney has already spent a half a billion dollars 
doing the research and the licensing cost of this project. And I also said that if you don't take this project, you will not get that money back. Remember, it's already spent a half a billion and not taking this project is not going to bring the money back. So let's ask this, the two questions about the half a billion. What will happen if I take the project? Well, I've already spent a half a billion. What will happen if I don't take the project? I'll already spent a half a billion. Nothing's happening. That's called a sunk cost. And because I've already spent it and I'm not going to get it back by not taking this project, it's not an incremental cash flow. So you know what I do? I take the half a billion out of my initial investment, out of the two and a half billion, I say, look, half a billion of that has nothing to do with the project. It's not incremental. My actual incremental investment is only two billion. So that's a sunk cost. And because I'm not going to get it back by rejecting the project, it's not incremental. That's the first example. The second is when I did my allocated GNA, I said this was GNA at Disney that's being allocated to the project. I was also explicit in telling you that two thirds of this GNA has nothing to do with this project. It's some guy working in Burbank whose costs are being allocated to the project. Two thirds of this expense are fixed. They're part of the company. And if this project did not exist, you know what would happen to them? They'd be allocated somewhere else. So let's ask that question again from Disney's perspective about that allocated GNA. If I don't take this project, what will happen to that two thirds of the allocated GNA? It's going to still be an expense to the company. If I take this project, it's still going to be there. This project is not going to affect that allocated GNA. So guess what I do? I add back that allocated GNA saying, look, I should never have subtracted this out. It's not an incremental expense. I know that's a little confusing, but essentially I'm saying if something is not incremental, I should not be treating it as part of the cash flows. He's saying, why is there a one minus T on the adding back? The way I get the add back is I take two thirds of the GNA in year three, for instance, I take the allocated GNA and I take two thirds of it. And I say that expense would have brought me a tax benefit that year, but the tax benefit is not incremental either. So I'm essentially nullifying the entire effect of the allocated GNA. It's actually very confusing to do this add back for factor. So I'm going to give you a different way in which you can get incremental cash flows. That's much easier to work with. Rather than subtract out the entire allocated GNA, what if I just subtracted out just the incremental GNA? That makes more sense, right? This is called an incremental income statement. So basically, I just subtract out only the incremental depreciation GNA and operating income and then add back only the incremental amounts. I get an exactly the same cash flow I got with the previous approach, but I'm getting an incremental cash flow. So to get, go from cash flows to incremental, I have to pass it through those two tests. Okay? The question of where I'm getting the GNA figures from, if you go back about 12 or 15 slides, uh, no, I, I don't know, I don't want to go back too much because it's too confusing. Early on when I described the project, I described how much GNA is allocated to the project. It's based on the revenues, you know, so more revenues a project has, the more GNA that gets allocated to it. So that's where the GNA figures come from in the first place. The incremental GNA is that one third of that GNA that is incremental, that's because of this project. And I'm focusing just on that amount. I don't know how many of you read the case already, but if you read the case and you get a sense of deja vu, you should, because many of the items I'm talking about in the context of Rio Disney are in the case as well. So if you haven't read the case, one suggestion I would make is as soon as you get a chance, you know, I would read the case as well, because you're going to see many of these things coming up. Darshan asks, so in effect, we're ignoring two thirds of the GNA? Exactly, we're ignoring it. The reason we're ignoring it is that it's nothing to do with the project. Those, that two thirds of the GNA is going to be there anyway, and we should not be subtracting it out in the first place. Okay? Now, one issue with the, with the sunk cost thing, because in all, of, in all of finance, this is a well-known concept. It's a notion of when you've, once you've spent something, or once you've already done something, you shouldn't be make, making decisions based on what's already happened. So you have a test marketing expense or an R&D cost, and you, you've already spent the money, it's too late to get the money back, so you treat it as a sunk cost. So it's very easy to see this in the abstract but it's very difficult to do in practice. Let me give you a much more simplistic example to illustrate this. Let's assume you go to the DMV. You know the DMV is, right? Where you go for your driver's license and you wait forever. 
you go in and you notice there's a line of 11 people waiting to get to the window. You say, that's not too bad. No, I have 30 minutes, I can wait in line. So you wait in line and the person at the counter takes forever. And 30, 23 minutes later, only one person has moved. So basically you have 10 people in line before, in front of you. Now, if you are a sensible, rational person, you know what you should do? You should say, look, no, this is taking too long, I should leave. But then you remember you've already spent 23 minutes standing in line. So you know what you do? You say, look, I don't want to waste that 23 minutes, so I'm going to wait in line a little longer. You're doing what you should not be doing, but we all do this. And companies do the same thing. In fact, in one of the most famous examples of all time called the Concord Fallacy, you know, there, an experiment was run with two groups of managers. And each group of managers was presented with an investment example. They were said, look, we've invested, you know, basically they said we've invested in this supersonic jet and we're ready to launch it, but it looks like one of our competitors has come up with a much better jet. And if we launch it now, you know, the revenues we'll be making is only a billion, but our expense will be a billion and a half, should we launch it. And of course, both rooms, you know, would say, don't do it, doesn't make any sense. But then in one of the two rooms, the person making the presentation added an additional fact. He said, we've already spent a billion and a half developing the supersonic jet. Would that change your decision? Now it shouldn't, right? It's still a bad investment. And given that looking forward, you're going to lose another half a billion, you shouldn't take it. But adding that additional fact of already having spent a billion and a half changed the decision of two thirds of the people in that room. What I'm trying to say, it's easy in the abstract to ignore sunk costs. It's very difficult in practice to ignore sunk costs. If you, you know, in this week's puzzle, I give you the example of A-Rod and the Yankees. I'm a Yankee fan and in 2009, the Yankees signed A-Rod to a 10-year contract for $275 million. Okay. I mean, in fact, they might have the same thing right now with the, again, Carlos Stanton. It's a $325 million contract. I could have upgraded the example. Maybe I'll rewrite the example. Now it's three years into Giancarlo Stanton's contract and it looks like he's going to play only like 15 games a season. He's always injured. Looking at the next seven years, if I gave you a chance to get out of this contract for $150 million, you should actually do it. You should say, look, you know what? That's, But the fact that you've already signed the contract, it's a sunk cost, makes it very difficult for you to step away from that cost. So in the abstract, you should be ignoring sunk costs in practice. It's very difficult to do it. No. In, um, and the, the point that Emily raises, you, you spend millions of dollars in R&D and IT, by the time you get to the decision process, it's too late to get it back. And that's why at companies, you need a process in place to judge R&D before you spend billions of dollars. Because once you've spent the billions of dollars, it's too late to get it back. And the depreciation on the sunk cost, you will still get as well. So that's not incremental either. That's why I added back the depreciation on the sunk cost as well, is that depreciation is going to be there as well. So anything that's going to happen anyway, you might as well ignore when you do your analysis. Okay. In fact, uh, I, I, pre I prejudged Emily's question. I got there ahead of it because with test marketing and R&D, this is the quandary. If you spend $100 million on, on test marketing, and then you get to the project analysis and you discover on the incremental basis, this project will add only 25 million value. You should take the project, but if every one of your projects looks like this, you spend 100 million first and then you get only 25 million back, you know what's gonna to happen to your company? You're gonna go bankrupt. That's why it's so critical that before you do test marketing R&D, you have a process in place where you do it only if the expected value makes sense. This is why decision trees can be very useful. If you've ever seen them in, in operations research or statistics, is you have to start thinking about the expense before you spend the money, because after you've spent it, it's too late to get it back. Any questions on incremental cash flows? It's a messy concept, but it's actually a very, very good concept to get your, brain, your mind around. And as you read the case, that's what I want you to do with every line item. I want you to ask the question, what will happen if I take the project? What will happen if I don't take the project? And think about the effect the project is making on the company's cash flows. 
That is your incremental effect and focus just on the incremental effect. That's what you should use in judging the project. Any questions? One final point about incremental is this allocated cost question is, you know, when, when you think about allocating costs to a project, every company does this. This is a very accounting thing to do. And some of you, when you're doing the project, will face the same issue when you compute accounting earnings. Should I allocate the studio cost? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's because you haven't read the case yet. But when you read the case, one of the issues I bring up is Netflix has to build an additional studio to meet its Netflix fit demand. Should I allocate the cost? Allocation is an accounting judgment and accountants do this all the time. They allocate based on something, number of employees, revenues, etc. To the degree that these costs are incremental costs, you want to bring them into the analysis. But if they're just allocations of existing costs, as in the Disney, Rio Disney, you shouldn't be factoring it in. in. The Rio Disney example, you'll notice I gave you the two thirds of the costs were fixed. You say, how do you ever know how much of the GNA costs are fixed? Don't try to do this on Netflix. It's too tough to do and too messy. But I'll give you a very simple example for you to illustrate how you might be able to figure out how much of your GNA cost is fixed and how much is incremental. Let's suppose I gave you three years of revenues and GNA cost, total GNA cost for a company. Okay? So let's say over the three years, here's what you saw. Your revenues went from a million to 1.2 million in year two, and then one, from 1.2 to 1.5 million in year three. And your GNA cost went from 250 million to 270 million to 300 million. Can you tell me how much of the 300 million dollar cost is variable? Is there a way to figure it out? Ryan, you said 10%. Can you explain? You can get on your mic if you want to tell me how you got the 10%. Uh, the 250 is for revenue year one. Yep. Yeah. And then we're increasing by two hundred dollars of revenue, which will be the twenty dollars in GNA cost that we're seeing incremental, and then three hundred would be the extra thirty that we're seeing. Does everybody get what he did? He took the change in revenues and the change in the GNA cost. That tells you ten percent that that GNA is ten percent of re of the incremental revenue. So you can see how much your your GNA is changing for the incremental revenues. Now the reason this works so well is I set, to set up a nice clean example where the GNA cost and the revenues follow this fixed pattern. Now do you see why I don't want you to try this on Netflix? You could try it if you want. Take 15 years of data from Capital IQ, take the revenues and the GNA costs and see how much they change over time. It's an interesting exercise, but it's really noisy with real companies. But that's one way to think about it. how much is, is variable, how much is fixed. Just look at how much your GNA costs change on a year to day, year basis as revenues change. So that's why in the project I gave you how much is incremental and how much is variable because trying to do this with a regular company can be messy if you don't have access to the insides of the company. So any questions on incremental cash flows? So we're into the final stage. We've gone from earnings to cash flows, from cash flows to incremental cash flows. Let's go from incremental cash flows to time-weighted incremental cash flows. This sounds fancy. You see, what the heck is time-weighting? In the old finance textbooks, there used to be a present value table at the end of the book. Most of them have kind of dispensed with this table now that we all have calculators. And what the present value table would give you is how much a dollar would, is worth in one year, two years, three years with different discount rates. So with a 10% discount rate, a dollar in a year was worth 91 cents and two years was 82 cents. So basically you could see how much a dollar was worth over time. That's a time waiting. When you take the present value of a cash flow, you're time waiting the cash flow. So when you discount cash flows, you're effectively time waiting them. That's it. So if you take your incremental cash flows and you discount them back, you've essentially time weighted these cash flows. So let's talk about different, uh, about simple present value mechanics. Now most of us, when, once we have that present value button in the calculator, have stopped using present value equations. So you can ignore this page if you want because you have the present value button. I'm a little old fashioned. I don't trust the present value button on my calculator. I actually prefer to use the equations that give you the present value. So if you don't trust me, you can take a payment and take, compute the present value of an annuity on your calculator and then try one of the, the, the annuity for an equation and you should get exactly the same answer. So here I have five types of cash flows and in a sense they cover the spectrum of pretty much every type of cash flow you will run into in finance. 
you can have a single cash flow in the future, $500 million 10 years from now. You take the cash flow and you divide by one plus R, raise the power 10, you got the present value. So that's a single cash flow. If you have an annuity, you take the annuity outside, then you, what you see inside the brackets is your present value factor for an annuity. If you have a growing annuity, this might not be built into your calculator, but you can actually, if you can program your calculator, it's well worth doing. You're saying, what's a growing annuity? Let's say I own a gold mine. I don't, but let's say I do. I expect to make a million dollars next year, and I expect that million dollars to grow 3% a year for the next 25 years. In the end of 25 years, the mine is empty. And I see what's the present value. There are two ways you can compute the present value. One is you can take the cash flows every year, 1 million, 1.03 million, and discount every cash flow back to the future and add up 25 cash flows, or you can use the shortcut. This shortcut will give you exactly the same present value, but essentially you can do it in one step. And then you have two cash flows that in finance are extraordinarily dangerous and powerful equations. The first is a perpetuity. I offer you $100 every year forever. That's a perpetuity. You take the cash flow and divide by the discount rate. So let's say your discount rate is 5%. $100 every year forever with a 5% discount rate will give you a present value of $2,000. 100 divided by 0.05. And finally, you have growing perpetuities. This is even more mind-boggling. You have a cash flow that is going to grow at a constant rate forever. You take your expected cash flow next year. It's always got to be next year's cash flow. And divide by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate. This is the most dangerous equation in finance. And you can see why, right? If you look at the denominator, you have R minus G. If you're not careful about what growth rate you use, you can have what I call buzz light to your present values. As G approaches R, your present value is going to approach infinity. And here's why it should never happen. This is a growth rate forever, right? And if it's a growth rate forever, it cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy in which you operate. So it can't be seven, eight percent. In US dollars, it might be one or two percent. You're saying, why throw currency in? If you have a higher inflation currency, you might have a higher growth rate, but your growth rate is going to be constrained to be less than the nominal growth rate of the economy and often less than the inflation rate because you can't have a project growing at the rate of the economy even forever. So those are the five present value equations you're ever going to run into. If you want, kind of program them into your calculator, but be aware of where it at least it is in, the, in your slides so you can come back to it if you ever want to look up a present value equation. So let's talk about two different ways in which I can compute time-weighted incremental cash flow measures of return. The first approach is net present value. Net present value is what you do. You take each incremental cash flow and you discount it back to today. Your one, your two, your three, and you discount them all back to today. Then you add up the present values of all of those cash flows, you get a net present value. And the rule with net present value is very easy. If your net present value is greater than zero, even if it's one dollar, you accept the project. You say, what if it's a billion dollar project? Why would I accept a net present value of a dollar? Let me throw that out. Why is even net present value of a dollar okay for a billion dollar project? Why is even a remotely small net present value show you that the project is good? Anybody? Because remember, somebody raised it's earning a little bit more than your cost of capital, right? Because remember, net present value is already with your cost of capital built in. You're, you're saying, I would like to earn a lot more. I would too. But remember the graph I showed you about how many companies earn less than the cost of capital? Beggars can't be choosers. If your best project has an NPV of $5, I would take it over doing nothing. I would rather that it be $5 billion. And that's why a net present value greater than zero is the only basic rule you need. And of course, the greater the net present value, the better the project. The problem with NPV is it's a, do it's a dollar value. You think, so what? If I asked you how your portfolio did last year, this might be a painful question. Nobody says my portfolio went up $37,000 or dropped $15,000. The answer you usually get is a percentage return. I made 17%, 7%, 3%. So people think in percentage returns. So there's a time-weighted discounted cash flow measure of return that's a percentage of return. It's called the internal rate of return. What's the IRR? The IRR is that discount rate that makes the net present value zero. 
So remember your cash flows. I can try different discount rates and there is some discount rate at which my net present value will be zero. That is my internal rate of return. You're saying, how would I use that internal rate of return? If my internal rate of return is greater than my hurdle rate, cost of capital or cost of equity or whatever discount rate I've used, then I would take the project. So let me summarize. There are two ways you can do a time-weighted cash flow measure of return. The first is NPV, where we take the present value of the cash flows and accumulate them and see if they're greater than zero. The other is IRR, where you do the internal rate of return and compare it to your cost of capital or cost of equity. Most of the time, the two will give you the same answer. Sometimes the two can give you divergent answers, especially when you're picking between projects. We'll come back and talk about those exceptions later, but those are the two time-weighted approaches. So let's try both on the Disney theme park. Before I do that, there's one thing I need to add to my analysis. If you remember when I did my, my accounting return on this theme park, a computer return on capital, I talked about the fact that I stopped after year 10 and how unfair it was to stop after year 10. Why? This is a theme park investment. And theme park investments last for 50, 60, 70 years. With accounting returns, I wave my hands and say, I wish I could have waited, I wish I could have extended, but there's not much I can do. But when I do cash flows, there's a way I can stop in year 10, but still bring in what happens afterwards. And here's what I'm going to do. And with the Disney theme park, I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption. I'm going to assume that after year 10, the cash flows will continue. They will continue and they will grow at the inflation rate. What I'm assuming is the number of visitors into the theme park levels off after year 10, but I'm able to keep increasing ticket prices, the inflation rate. So my cash flows will continue after year 10, growing at 2% a year forever. You know what that allows me to do? Is to stop in year 10 and then say, look, after year 10, I have a growing perpetuity. Remember the equation I showed you? And the present value of growing perpetuity is my cash flow one year out. Let me wait a while. Can you hear me now? Tell me when you can hear me again. Okay. So I'm going to stop in year 10, but I'm going to assume after year 10, the cash flows will continue to grow at 2% a year forever. And because it's a growing perpetuity, I can compute the present value of those cash flows as the cash flow in year 11, which is the cash flow in year 10, 715 million, grown out one extra year. You always have to do this. Divided by the difference between my discount rate. Remember that 8.46% cost to capital I computed for this project? minus the growth rate forever of 2%, giving me a value of 11,275 million. This is called a terminal value. There are two ways you can apply closure in a project. One is to stop the project in year 10 and do what's called salvage value, where you sell off the pieces for whatever you can get, or continue the project after year 10. And it doesn't have to be forever. It can be for 30 more years or 50 more years and get a present value. And this 11,275 million, which is the terminal value, is the value of this project continued beyond year 10. So now I'm ready. Here's what I have. I have my incremental cash flows. If you go back and review the slides on incremental cash flows, you can see these are the cash flows after adding back the allocated GNA. These are the incremental cash flows. The 11,275 million is my terminal value. Now let's imagine that you're presenting this to Disney managers. My guess is they're going to focus on this gigantic number, 11,275 million, because it's by far the biggest number in the calculation. And when I compute my present value with that terminal value built in, I get a net present value of 3.3 billion. And they ask you, what exactly is this terminal value? You know the intuitive way of describing it? It's what I would get if I sold Rio Disney, lock, stock, barrel, and Mickey included. Mickey's got to be included. Otherwise, people are not going to pay the 11275 million. That's what a terminal value is. It's a value of the project as a going concern. That is tipping the balance. And discounted back at the 8.46% cost of capital, I get an NPV of 3.3 billion. Now, before I, we talk about what that NPV means, now do you see why I sequenced things the way I did? When I was taught corporate finance, we did capital budgeting first and discount rates later. And the problem with doing capital budgeting first is to do capital budgeting, you need a discount rate. And we'd make up stuff and then afterwards we found out where those numbers came from. So the reason we had to get cost of equity and cost of capital and do it at the business level is we needed to do project analysis. So discounted back 
at the Rio Disney Caustic Tap, which reflects the fact that it's a theme park in Rio, I get a net present value of 3.3 billion. And we say, what exactly does that mean? If I take, first it tells you the project should be accepted. It's a good project. And by taking this project, Disney will increase its value as a firm by 3.3 billion. Why does that matter? If you remember, what's the objective in corporate finance? It's to maximize the value of your business. By taking net present value projects, projects with a positive net present value, increase your value, you're being consistent with that objective. So if I take a project which, is, which has a net present value of zero, you know what happens to my value as a company? Absolutely nothing. What if I take a project, you know, with a net present value of minus three billion? What do you think will happen to my value as a company? If I take a project with a net present value of minus three billion, to go down three billion. You see, why would I be stupid enough to do it? You know, every year there are companies that do this over and over again. You know what it happens? Is when you do a big acquisition and you overpay, you've effectively taken a project with a huge negative net present value. Now, one of the questions that Rizwana had about the terminal value is what am I discounting? I'm discounting it back at my 8.46% for 10 years. So basically the 11,275 million, I used the growing perpetuity equation. But to discount it back today, I treat it like any other single cash flow. I discount it back at 8.46%, just as, as I would discount back the 715 million. So net present value tells you not only whether the project will be accepted or rejected, or also tells you what will happen to your value as a company if you take this project. Okay? Any questions on NPV and cash flows and terminal value? Any of the mechanics? Okay, so let's talk about IRR. Now, again, if I, if I asked you, how do you compute the IRR for a set of cash flows? You're saying, that's easy. I use the IRR function in Excel or the IRR button on my calculator. And that's true. That's how most of us compute IRR. I'm actually old fashioned. The way I compute IRR is I take my cash flows and I try different discount rates. This is called an NPV profile. And what I do here is I try an 8% discount rate and 9%. And for most projects, as you raise the discount rate, the net present value will decrease. You see why for most? There are some projects where the reverse will happen. We'll talk about these later when we talk about exceptions to the rule. But for most projects, as I raise my discount rate, my net present value is going to go down. You're saying, how does this help me find the IRR? Well, remember the IRR is that net present value, that discount rate that makes my net present value zero, right? So there it is, right there on the graph, okay? So if I can find that IRR, basically I found my, my IRR is 12.6%. You say, how do I use this? Very simple. I compare it to my cost of capital, 8.46%. My time-weighted incremental rate of return for this project is 12.6%. My cost of capital is 8.46%. I would take the project. Both the NPV and the IRR are signaling the same thing. And when you have standalone projects, that's almost always going to be the case. When you're trying to pick between projects, there can be issues. And even with standalone projects, sometimes you can have issues with the internal rate of return. As I said, we'll come back and talk about when the two approaches can give you different answers. But most of the time, the two, because they come from the same source, they're both time-weighted incremental cash flow returns, will give you the same conclusion. If NPV says take a project, IRR is probably going to lead you to the same place. Okay? Okay. There, uh, we'll talk about the three differences. The three differences between NPV and IRR. First, NPV, there can be only one NPV. It's always unique. IRR, you can sometimes have more than one IRR. We'll talk about cases. Second, NPV is a dollar value compared to zero. IRR is a percentage rate of return. NPV is therefore likely to be larger for big projects because it's a dollar value. And IRR is going to be larger for small scale projects because it's a percentage return. And finally, both approaches make assumptions about those cash flows you get in year one, year two, year three. Remember in the Disney theme park, there are cash flows every year for the next 10 years. The NPV assumes that those cash flows get in reinvested back at your cost of capital, the 8.46%. The IRR assumes that you can reinvest those cash flows back at your internal rate of return of 12.6%. I'm going to let you think about which one's a more dangerous assumption. We'll come back and talk more about the reinvestment assumption. But those are the three fundamental differences between NPV and IRR. 
Any questions on um, the mechanics of what we did? So, reviewing again, we started with the accounting earnings on this project to compute a return on capital of about 4 to 4.1 to 4.2 percent for the project. And based on the return on capital, we almost rejected the project, but I tried to stop it. I said, don't do it yet. I looked at only 10 years, and this is an accounting measure of return. Then we get, went from earnings to cash flows by adding back depreciation, subtracting our capex, and subtracting our change in working capital. And then we went from cash flows to incremental cash flows by asking those two questions. What will happen if I take the project? What will happen if I don't take the project? And as a consequence, we took out the sunk cost of a half a billion, and we added back the portion of the allocated g &A that's going to be there anyway. And then we time weighted those incremental cash flows using the risk adjusted discount rate for this project, which is the cost of capital. Why? Because I looked at cash flows before debt payments. I, and I used the cost of capital for Disney theme parks adjusted for country risk because this theme park is in Rio. And based on the NPV and the RR, at least, it looks like this is a good investment. So I'm going to pause a minute or two. I've thrown a lot at you. I just want to make sure there are no questions before I do the last few slides for today. Now, let's do a couple of loose ends that I want to tie up. When I did my initial analysis for this theme park, I said I was cheating. You know what I mean by cheating, right? The theme park is going to... Oh, what, I have a question. Shashanka's question was, is return on invested capital the best to measure historical rate of return? Are there better measures than return on invested capital? There's another measure called CFROI, which also uses historical data. The problem is they're all historical data. The problem with historical data is you're getting one slice of history. It's very difficult to make overall judgments. So unfortunately, I don't think there are very good measures of past returns. Return on invested capital, CFROI, if you had access to the actual project numbers in a company, if you worked at a company, you might be able to get better measures of returns. But, but that's tough to do. So in a sense, you're stuck with what you have. So let's talk about currency. The, the currency with these cash flows would have actually been, would have been Brazilian reais. I did everything in dollars because my analysis, it was easier to work in dollars. So I used dollar cash flows and a dollar cost of capital. So I have a question. If I'd done this entire analysis in Brazilian reais, remember I got a positive net present value and um, IRR greater than the cost of capital with, with dollar numbers, would my analysis have led to a different conclusion if I'd done everything in Brazilian reais? I'm going to let you try to think about the answer to the question. Perry says no. Perry, I'm going to pick on you since you've said no. So put your audio on. First, let me take you through the cash flows. If I did my cash flows in Brazilian reais, am I going to get higher cash flows or lower cash flows? I am assuming that you will have higher growth rates in that. And tell me why I'm going to have higher growth rates. Because I'm assuming the Brazilian reais has the higher inflation rate. Okay, so my cash flows are going to grow much faster because of inflation as kind of a tailwind, right? So my cash flows are going to be much higher. But then tell me what else is going to change. My, the, my, when I'm discounting, the interest rate is going to be higher because it's this, going to be... Exactly. Remember when we talked about currencies, yeah. we talked about what drives differences in currencies is differences in inflation. So when I switch from dollars to reais, I'm going to have a higher growth rate because my infl inflation is going to help me and I'm going to have a higher discount rate. Let's see if this is actually true. Here's what I did. So I first have to make sure that I follow the consistency rule, which is if I want to do everything in reais, I have to do my discount rate and my cash flows in RI. And I'll tell you up front, if you do this right, you will get the same net present value. But doing it right is going to be tricky. So let's first convert our cash flows from dollars to reais. To convert my cash flows from dollars to reais, what do I need for year one, year two? So I have my cash flows already in dollars, right? So to convert dollar cash flows to real cash flows, what do I need? I'm assuming for year one, you will just multiply it with the exchange rate. Okay, so we need exchange rates, right? Let, let me pause right there. How do I get my expected exchange rate for next year? Current exchange rate and the difference in different currency... Inflation currency. rates. It's called purchasing power parity. It's one of the oldest theorems in, 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 in exchange rate. So if I'm my exchange rate today, 
and my inflation rate, let's say in Brazil is 9%, the inflation rate in the US is 2%, the Brazilian real is going to depreciate by roughly 7%. It's a very old and rough approximation, but it's a very good one in the long term. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the expected exchange rate every year using that 7% differential inflation. But I'm also going to adjust my cost of capital, which is a dollar cost of capital for the same differential inflation. So you see what's going to happen? My exchange rate is going to reflect the difference in inflation. My discount rate is also going to reflect the difference in inflation. I'm going to have much higher growth rates and cash flows and much higher discount rates. Let's see if the magic works. When I discount my, it says, but it should be REI cash flows, and I discount my REI cash flows at a REI cost. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, who is that? Did somebody have a question? Okay. So I discount my REI cash flows at the REI cost of capital of 15.91%. I get a net present value in reais of 7.75 billion reais. If I convert it at the exchange rate at the day that I did this, which is 2.35 reai to a dollar, I get a net present value exactly equal to the nth decimal point to the net present value I'd have got if I'd used entirely US dollar numbers. I know it's, it's tricky and messy, so let me review again what I did. In my original analysis, I had dollar cash flows and a dollar cost of capital. In this analysis, I've converted my dollar cash flows into nominal REI cash flows using an expected exchange rate. I got that expected exchange rate using the difference in inflation between the two currencies. I also adjusted the discount rate for that same differential inflation. When I discount my nominal REI cash flows at a nominal REI discount rate, I get exactly the same net present value. You can already see why in practice people mess up. I've seen people take REI cash flows and convert them to dollar cash flows all the way through using today's exchange rate. If you do that, here's what's going to happen. You're going to end up finding that if I use REI discount rates, I get a much lower net present value than if I use dollar cash flows, simply because I've built in different inflation rates into my numerator and my denominator. Be consistent about inflation. That is key to making sure that everything works out in the same direction. So I'm going to pause and let, let you ask questions because, you know, this is, I think, a tricky question and it's a question of, that you will face. In, you, know, you might not have an issue with Netflix because everything is given in dollars. But if you go back home and you're doing a, you know, and your home is in Asia or Latin America and you're doing, working with a high inflation currency, this is often a question you will confront. Should we do everything in dollars? Should we do everything in reais? The answer it doesn't matter. Pick one and be consistent. No questions? So I'm going to stop there because I think we've covered enough for today and leave the last five minutes or so for questions. So if there are any questions, I will hang out here if you want to sign off because you're exhausted and you don't want to listen to any more audio, that's okay too. No, but I'll hang out here for another five minutes for questions in case people might have them about any of the stuff that we've done in today's class. Uh, Darshan has a question on an earlier portion where in the return on capital would using market values for debt and equity. Remember we use book values to get return on capital and I said this is the only place in finance we use book values. You may say why can't I use market values? I'll tell you why. Let's take a company like, like Microsoft, right? It has a huge market value. If I compute return on capital based on market value, I might get a return of only 6%. If I use that to judge Microsoft to be a bad company, it's incredibly unfair. And here's why. Market value reflects not just existing assets, but growth assets. So when you have a company where the market is giving you credit for future growth, your market value of equity is going to be really high, but you, you don't get a chance to make returns on it yet because those projects haven't been taken. What you would really like is market value of assets in place and with fair value accounting, you might get that, but be careful what you wish for. If assets in place are truly marked up to market, you know what the return on capital for every company is going to be? It's going to be equal to the cost of capital because that's the definition of market value. So unfortunately, using market values will not give you a good answer. You're stuck using book values. So you've got to work through the accounting to make sense of it.
You, you can unmute yourself and ask a question to it. You know, I, at this point, I think you know it's it's fine because we're reaching the end. Um, hi, Professor. You were saying that um, that you want to keep inflation consistent when you're making calculations mm -hmm. across currencies. Yeah. Uh, what are some common mistakes? Do, do people take um, current inflation um, in one part and then? Inflation in another, in another. Oh, it, it, think of every conceivable wrong combination and you've seen and it gets done. I've seen US companies value foreign companies where they get the cash flows in the local currency, but they use their dollar cost of capital to discount those cash flows. I've seen Brazilian companies where the, the, the Brazilian will convert, will convert all the cash flows into real cash flows, not real cash flows, but real cash flows, basically no inflation and discount them back at a dollar cost of capital, which means you have a zero inflation rate built into the numerator and a dollar inflation rate built into the denominator. Think of every conceivable mismatch you can and it happens. The most common one though, is when people use exchange rates that come from experts. Right? They get, because many of these experts have a view on exchange rates. As the real will get stronger or weaker, they'll use those expected exchange rates to convert the cash flows while using a dollar cost of capital. If you do that, you're all is lost because what you've essentially done is built two different views on inflation. So even if you have an expert who gives you views on, ex on exchange rates, you shouldn't be bringing that into project analysis because a project needs to stand on its own two feet. It can't be made good because you have a view on, ex on exchange rate. So every conceivable mismatch you can think of happens in practice. So be, whenever I look at a discounted cash flow valuation, especially if it's a, a cross-border acquisition, that's the first thing I check for. Shashanka is a, has another question. It seems that ROIC is not a, a great method to judge how good a company has been in taking on projects. No. And there's no method better than ROIC. There is, I mean, that's why when, you know, if, if you look at accounting returns and you're judging a company, you should be careful about how stringent, what you do with that judgment. I'm not saying don't compute return versus gap. For some companies, it's a pretty good measure of how good existing projects are. For other companies, it's a stop in a very long journey. You compute return on investment capital with Netflix, you're gonna conclude it's a terrible company. It's return on capital, looks terrible right now. But my, but that might be unfair because you know Netflix is still evolving, it's still building its user base. So sometimes just bringing in return on capital plus common sense into your judgment can help you make a better judgment. So my question is again around the present value of Value. Right. Um, let so me go, let me go back to that page because then you can see what you know. So let's take the so tell me what make the question specific. So your eleven thousand two seventy five is your terminal value. Yes. So my question is that we used a particular R and G to get to that terminal. We value. use we use the same R eight point four six percent. Yeah, and do we use the same RNG again to discount it back? There's no RNG in discounting it back. In discounting it back, you just take the 11,275 as if it's a single cash flow. And then divide it by R minus G, right? No, 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 no. That would be double counting. We already got the R minus G out of the way to get to the 11,275. You take the 11,275 and discount it back 10 years at 8.46. It would be 1.0846 raised to the power 10. So just a simple present value. Oh, okay, got it. You can't do a perpetuity, growing perpetuity of a growing perpetuity. That'll multiply it into a trillion dollar value. So don't do that. Right. And in terms of the last uh, slide that we worked on, yeah. this is under the assumption that, that purchasing power parity actually falls. In the long term. No, no, no. You're not even making that assumption. You're just saying, look, this project has to be good if purchasing power parity holds. Because if it doesn't hold, you could get a bonus, right? Let's say the RIA, instead of depreciating over the next 10 years, appreciates. This project will get to be even better, right? So that's what you're doing. You're making the project, you're checking the pro to see if the project is a good project or a bad project with purchasing power parity holding. And then you bring in your views and exchange rates. I think the RIA is going to strengthen and that becomes icing on the cake. But you do, should not be taking a project just because your views and exchange rates. Do you see what I'm saying? So. Yes. 
I'm not even assuming purchasing power parity holds. I just want to make sure the projects I take are good projects if purchasing power parity holds. And then, then I bring in my views on exchange rates and all the neat stuff I want to do with exchange rates. Thank you. Oh. That's a question. Yeah. I, I may be overthinking this, but if I am doing this calculation in the US dollars, yeah. I'm assuming the company wants to report everything in US dollars at, at a headquarter level, uh, shouldn't I start with the cost of hedging? Uh, like you could, but remember, he, when you when you hedge, hedging is driven by interest rate parity, and interest rate parity is driven by purchasing power parity. Do you see what I'm saying? It's it's just different ways of getting to the same. Have a cost, right? I'm sorry. Like, I'll tell you where I'm coming from. Yeah. And maybe we were doing it wrong. I was working for an Indian steel company before this. Yeah. We were valuing in a, a mine in Australia. So whatever the income was, we had an agreement that that would be converted into INR uh, at the certain defined rate for it. Then, then you're okay. Day. Then, you then, that yeah. Then you have the numbers already in dollars. Do you discount rate then work in dollars as well, or did you do a rupee discount rate? Rupee discount rate because our is money coming into India. The ratio was defined. Okay, so by the exchange rate. So you had a, for your dollar numbers were based upon a forward exchange contracts that set the dollar Australian dollar to US dollar, or did which one was were you hedging the rupee dollar or the Australian dollar US dollar? We wanted to be sure about how many rupees we received. Okay, so you were you had for you had entered into forward contracts and. That's fine. Then if you you can use the forward. The problem is forward rates run out after two or three years. You can't do them for ten year cash flows. Or if you do them, it's going to be really expensive. No, we we assumed that this will be the difference every year, and this will be the cost of doing something like this. So you subtracted that from your cash flows then as a hedging expense. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Then you you know what that takes into account. The miss. It's got nothing to do with the project analysis per se, but remember we talked about mismatching currencies. This is one way to get rid of the mismatch is you buy hedging and you protect yourself. So in a sense, you protected this against, against default risk and you've reduced your cash flows and projects to do it. That's okay. I'll reduce your cash flows by that expense. I'll discount back now at whatever, whatever currency you've decided to do the analysis in. And you should get a lower net present value than you have without the hedging but at least as a company, you're now safer. Okay, folks, I think we're at the end of an hour and 20 minutes. So I, I'm sorry for the audio kind of going in and out a few times, but I, as I said, the recording should be crystal clear because it's on my computer. So I'll put it on probably later today and, um, and pass the message on if for people who are not able to, to sit in because of the time difference or whatever, you know, they should be able to watch the recorded video. So I will see you on Wednesday. Take care.